Hey, well, there we are. Uh, hi, and a uh, little bit of excitement there. Nothing like an IT crash uh, right <laughs> as you're starting the show. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. Kelly Victory, filling in for uh, Dr. Drew, who's traveling today. Um, I have a really great show with one of uh, my favorite people and our favorite guests, Ed Dowd, who I'm going to bring in sooner than later since we ate up a little bit of, uh, of his time on the show uh, dealing with some technical issues. Thank you, Caleb, for getting it sorted out. Um, but before I bring Ed in, um, I was thinking, you know, we just marked the official four-year anniversary of the uh, the pandemic or the scamdemic uh, or the COVID debacle, however you want to look at it. Um, I think it was March 20th. That was the official date of the uh, two weeks to flatten the curve uh, lie. And uh, in these last four years, uh, an awful lot has happened, but just in the past, recent past, last couple of weeks, we've had some monumental things that really have started, I think, to, to perhaps uh, turn the tide here. We've got the Missouri v. Biden case, now known as uh, Murphy v. Biden, which is the case against the federal government for censorship and the egregious affront to free speech uh, by colluding with uh, big tech and the main mainstream media to silence the voices of uh, quite a few Americans. And during this, uh, it's now being heard by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments uh, this past week or the week before. Um, also, this last week, we saw the FDA forced to capitulate uh, with regard to their disinformation campaign that they ran uh, on ivermectin during the uh, COVID pandemic. They are, have been forced to take down all of the disinformation, the social media posts and other postings that they said uh, with regard to the fact that, you know, their, their claim uh, that ivermectin Mectin didn't work and was horse paced and all of that other nonsense. That was a great case brought by some real titans uh, in the medical world, including Pierre Corey, an, another friend of this show, and uh, Drs. Merrick and uh, Mary Talley Bowden, uh, who brought that case. Uh, so it was very quiet, but uh, the FDA has been forced to concede that fundamentally they lied. Uh, we're also seeing uh, the reversal of vaccine mandates on a lot of college campuses, uh, university campuses, and that's all great. All of that said, uh, at the same time in the parallel universe, we're seeing uh, concerns about avian flu when you still keep hearing about disease X out there. Um, and there's always the ever, the you know, the crowd favorite booster, booster, booster that's being, um, you know, promulgated by the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies. So there are two things happening at the same time while people are opening their eyes, I think, to the reality of what happened during the pandemic. Um, there's still a lot to be afraid of with regard to what's happening uh, and the, you know, the powers that be that are continuing to raise the fear flag. And that's one of the reasons I was thrilled to have our guest, uh, Dowd, uh, who I'm going to bring on, as I said, after this break, to really talk about the latest. Ed always shows up with the receipts. He always brings the goods. So he has the data with regard to some interesting and uh, somewhat concerning trends that we're seeing with regard to disease processes and disability. Um, and one of the things that I love about Ed is he's not here to say uh, necessarily what's causing it. He's just exposing the data uh, and we can discuss uh, some possible uh, ideas about what's causing it, you and I. Uh, both know what we think it is, uh, but let's uh, let's cut to the break so I don't eat up any more of his time, and I'll come back and uh, and bring Ed with me after I return. Thanks. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor. For <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say.
Let's talk about aging because everyone wants to know how to slow it down. For almost a decade, I've been taking a healthy aging supplement called True Niagen. This supplement boosts NAD. That's something that cells can't live without. It's done with a patented form of nicotinamide riboside called NR or Niagen. It's more efficient and more scientifically reviewed than NMN or other NAD boosters. True Niagen is truly the best way to boost NAD levels. And it's made by Chromadex. They're the gold standard in the NAD space. Dr. Charles Brenner, the scientist who discovered the NAD boosting potential of NR, explains. And the center of the metabolism that allows the conversion of food into energy is NAD coenzymes. And NAD gets disturbed um, in the aging process. And as we're exposed to conditions of metabolic stress, mm. niagen, which is the... Um, form of, of NR that was developed by Chromadex is the, is the best and the only fully legal form of NR. And this is really the gold standard for NAD boosting uh, vitamins. I love this product. I urge you to try it. Go to drdrew.com slash trueniagen for 20% off your order. That is drdrew.com slash trueniagen, T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N, and enter Dr. Drew at checkout, D-R-D-R-E-W, and are ready to check out for 20% off. Thanks again for joining me. And again, my apologies for our little uh, IT glitch there at the beginning and the uh, subsequent delay. Um, I'm joined today by Ed Dowd, who uh, most of you know. He's been on the show many times, uh, and he's been a remarkable um, researcher during this last four years of the COVID debacle. Uh, Ed Tech, you know, was a former uh, Wall Street guy. He is a BlackRock portfolio manager. He now is been the founder of uh, Finance Technologies and importantly, the author of the book, um, Cause Unknown, the Epidemic of Sudden Deaths in 2021 and 2022. He has exposed more data with regard to trends and alarming uh, information about increases in disease processes and disabilities um, throughout the pandemic. One of the things I think that is interesting about him is that he's not a medical professional. He's not a physician. He's not a scientist. He's somebody who made a living looking at trends in pattern recognition. That's how he got ahead in Wall Street, uh, by looking at patterns. And it was bringing that pattern recognition capability and expertise to what was going on in COVID that uh, brought him to where he is now. So I'm going to bring Ed on. There's so much stuff I want to cover with him. Uh, he's got some new data to share with us, uh, as well as we're going to probably, if we have time, talk about a very uh, new study, a preprint, actually looking at some information about quote, long COVID and uh, perhaps the causes of long COVID and whether it's actually a disease process in and of itself or is actually um, is a tangential or offshoot of a vaccine injury. So let's bring Ed on here and uh, we'll get into the details. Hey, Ed, thanks for joining me. Sorry about the glitch. Uh, no problem. Great to be here. Where do you want to start? Yeah, well, actually, before we get into the first kind of date, new data, take five minutes, if you will, because I didn't do a very good job of explaining how you got into this. Tell for the people who may not have heard you live before or really know of your background, how it is that you went from a Wall Street BlackRock guy to somebody who knows anything about or is even vaguely invested in or interested in what is happening in a pandemic. What got you, you know, even interested in this and, you know, sort of heightened your awareness that something was awry? Well, I'm a Wall Street executive, uh, formerly a growth portfolio manager at BlackRock, and we analyze trends in company earnings and revenues and growth projections. And we also looked at the industry-wide data to get a handle on trends. Uh, and you wanted to identify a trend uh, honestly, right around when the time it's changing so that you can be the first one to the trend before anybody else sees it. That's how you make the most money. So my brain is wired to see trends. And honestly, when uh, the pandemic hit uh, and there was the introduction and, and fanfare about a new novel, uh, untested therapy, uh, I 
just had the inclination to pause personally and say, I'm not taking anything that hasn't been tested on humans, done under Operation Warp Speed, and also knowing that uh, it takes seven to 10 years for a vaccine to be properly vetted. So I paused and I live on Maui. And in my friend group, not one person I knew got COVID. We heard of people getting COVID, but no one in my friend group in 2020 got COVID. Then in 2021, people started getting COVID and uh, people started getting uh, the vaccine. And I started hearing about adverse reactions anecdotally, about people's uncles dying mysteriously on the mainland. So look, I'm a stats guy and I know if this thing was as safe as they said it was, I anecdotally shouldn't be hearing anything. The odds of me hearing something you know, one case, one adverse event should be, you know, near impossible, but I was hearing multiple. So that just got my interest. Uh, I had a thesis, something was going wrong here. So it's a thesis at that point. And then as time rolled on, the mandates came. And that's when I became politically a- activated and started protesting the mandates. Dr. Malone happened to come to uh, Maui. I, I had a dinner with him and uh, he suspected there was issues with the vaccine as well. And I said, look, if we're right, it'll start showing up in uh, places where people might not suspect, like insurance company results, uh, funeral home results, and they did. And then uh, as time went on, I, you know, uh, people started helping me. Josh Sterling was one of the first. He was a former Wall Street insurance uh, sell side analyst. We started looking at C- CDC data. He then went off to go do uh, the Coalition to Save Lives. And then uh, in, around summer of 2022, uh, I hooked up with two guys in finance, uh, Carlos Allegri and Yuri Nunes. We founded a company called Finance Technologies. And it's uh, basically a, a twofold company at this point. It's a, and it, the, the first project was to figure out what's going on with the, the, the metadata in terms of excess deaths, disabilities, injuries, started looking at causes. So that was kind of like our pro bono work that we did pre revenue. And we're in the process of trying to raise capital right now for our hedge fund strategy, which, of course, you know, utilizes data and market information and fundamental economic indicators. And now we have amassed two, three years worth of uh, this this other kind of data. And it's uh, it's it's something that is going to probably turn into a business because our 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 uh, our company was founded upon uh, taking data, turning it into knowledge, turning that, uh, uh, taking data, turning it into information, information into knowledge, and then decision-making. So what we've collected is a business. And uh, what we don't make a public, publicly available is projections. That's something people will pay for. But we, we happily provide all the damage that's been done uh, since the, uh, me- the countermeasures from the pandemic. And, you know, you can, you, can, you can point fingers at whatever you want, but the bottom line scorecard is it's a disaster. And whatever they did, uh, it resulted in more excess deaths, disabilities, and injuries, uh, you know, in most of the Western nations. Exactly. And I want to get into that data. I might make as an aside, by the way, that pattern recognition and, you know, analysis of trends used to be what we called back in the olden days, science. Um, that's what scientists used to do back when they had integrity. Uh, and they would follow those trends, look at that data and actually be interested, have some intellectual curiosity uh, to say, wow, what is causing that trend? One of the things that you and I have talked about quite a bit off line, Ed, is why is it, and we can get into this later, why is it that the powers that be, the organizations, specifically the CDC uh, and others, whose job it is to analyze these trends and to understand why we are having increases in certain disease processes or disabilities, why is it that they have been absolutely remiss? You know, they're nowhere to be found. Here we got, you know, a, a former BlackRock guy, Wall Street analyst, uh, and a group of your friends and colleagues who are diving into the scientific detail uh, when the organizations who are empowered to do that or really mandated to do that on behalf of the American people are nowhere to be found. Um, I find that interesting. Um, before you actually get into the most recent data, which I want to talk about, which includes some stuff about um, cancer specifically and also disabilities, talk a little bit about your book too. Your book's been out now for over a year, right? A Cause Unknown About the Sudden Deaths. Talk a little bit about that book and what you expose in the book. Well, the book the book uh, came out in uh, December 2022, and you know we're a year and uh, a quarter into it, uh, more data since the book. So we've discovered way more than the book has in it right now. But the biggest thing we found was there was a mix shift from old to young. Uh, in, in, in 2020, there were about 500,000 excess deaths in the U.S. 
mostly old. And then mysteriously in 2021, we saw a mix shift. And to get to put to put number put numbers to it, which I did in in front of Senator Ron Johnson in February in in, in a recent Senate uh, uh, hearing. It wasn't a he- official hearing; it was a committee. But uh, I was able to give the scorecard, and there were about 124,000 uh, deaths in the age group uh, 15 or 16 through uh, 64, which is the working age group. And that was in 2020. Those were the, that was the absolute number of excess deaths. Then in 2021, it shot up to about 224,000 excess deaths, about a 75% increase. And the same number of excess deaths occurred in 2020 and 2021, except that we just, we just shifted around who got hit hard. And so the old people died mm-hmm. mostly in 2020, and then the young accelerated in 2021. And that's very curious. Uh, if, you act, if you talk to any virologist, that's, uh, those numbers are just way out there. That, that you, you don't go from a virus that attacks the old and goes after working age population. We also found that disability seemed right. to go up. Disability seemed to go up uh, uh, for the working for those who are employed the most. So we added about four million new disabilities from the five year, four year trend before that, starting in February of 21, and half of them were employed. So why did the employed get hit harder than the whole general U.S. population? Their rate of change in disability rate was 38 percent. The general U.S. population's rate of change in disabilities was nine. So, you know, this is uh, this is this is, you know, not exactly rocket science. My thesis is the vaccine is the predominant cause of that. That, that, that phenomenon, that new novel. Now, that's my opinion. And as time goes on and we do more work, uh, it's becoming increasingly clear the vaccine had a large part to do with what's going on today. Oh, I think it's irrefutable. And for those people who, who haven't connected the dots, I mean, yes, the reason it went, the, those disabilities and, and deaths went up in the, the working age population is because that's who was mandated to take the vaccines. Um, so there was a, they were largely vaccinated uh, populations that had the increases in these disabilities. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about the newest data that, that you have crunched, if you will, um, with regard to you know, start wherever you want to start. We've got a couple different uh, charts I know that you provided, and I'm happy to, you know, start where you'd like to start. And we'll, we'll you know, walk us through it. Uh, we'll walk me through it like I'm five years old, like I don't have any scientific background. So we understand what these charts and what this data reveals. Yeah. So before we put up charts, let me give you a little background. So we put out a paper last September on the UK in, in, in cancers in the same age group we just are about to talk about in the U.S. So it was 15 to 44. The problem we had with that data was uh, it was incomplete. 2022 had a disconnect between registered deaths and causes, about a 30% gap. So we made what we call adjusted numbers uh, using ratios. We think the, the, uh, and the, 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 the methodology is sound. So we came up with uh, rising, we showed rising cancers. So what we wanted to do with this next paper was corroborate our findings in the UK, in the US. The good news about the US is we, we, uh, the data is provisional, but it's more complete. So we don't have the adjusted number problem we had in the UK. So we've, we put out uh, two papers recently. The first one I'm gonna talk about is ages 15 to 44, same age group as the UK. And we had a uh, contributor on this paper, Dr. David Wiseman, who is a PhD epidemiologist. And we dropped it on ResearchGate as a preprint a couple of weeks ago. And in chart one, I just want to show you in this age group what happened. Um, we saw a slight rise in, uh, this is underlying causes. We looked at underlying causes and multiple causes, but this is just underlying cause, just cancer as the primary cause of death. And it went up 1.7% in 2020 with a Z-score of three and a half. So a slight signal. So something happened in 2020 that needs to be investigated, but it really accelerated in 2021, went up 5.6% in this age group. 11.8% 11.8 standard deviation z score and then went up 7.9% uh uh in 2022 16 and a half standard deviation so you can see there was a trend down of cancer in this age group and then it changed in, in uh, starting slightly in 2020 a little bit above trend then it took off in 21 and 22 um, and, and just uh, uh, let me just interject, let me interject here for one second, just to put some sort of clinical color on this as well. You know, cancer is largely a disease of the very young and the very old. Uh, there are certain cancers that attack the young, primarily the leukemias, uh, in the in attack 
viciously, unfortunately. And then cancers generally, we start to see increases in cancers in people after the age of 55 or 60. The age group 15 to 45 is not a group of people in which in whom you normally see large numbers of cancers anyway. So seeing this trend, I think you said a five plus percent increase uh, from 2021 20, to 2022 is massive in a group of people in whom you don't normally see a lot of cancers in the first place. It was 7.9 from 22, uh, from 21 to 22, uh, above, above trend. It was 5.6 above trend mm -hmm. in 21, 7.9% above trend in 2022, if the trend had continued. So um, this is huge. And uh, the next chart just shows the, the, the uh, Z scores uh, for, for both multiple cause and underlying cause um, deaths. And th that's not that important. It just shows that something changed and it started uh, really in uh, 2020 uh, and really accelerated in 2021. So we in the paper, we cite uh, what we speculate as to possible causes. We, we speculate as to COVID, uh, a missed cancer screening treatments, which you know, if, honestly doesn't really occur in this age group. So that we put it in there, we put it in the paper, we put in lockdowns and we put in vaccines. So we named all four as possible causes that need to be investigated but vaccines need to be in there. And I personally and the team thinks it's mostly the vaccines. But again, we're, 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 we're putting out a trend. It's a real trend. And I'm not going to get into the debate that it's not happening because it's happening and we're going to sell this information and make money. So what all the trolls who want to get into it's not happening, good luck to you. Um, so this is, this is, this is uh, what we're seeing. It's a disturbing trend in this age group, which shouldn't be happening like this. It's just, it's tragic. No, and the re... And yeah, and the reason I brought up the issue about it being cancer being primarily a disease of the very young and the and the older uh, age group is specifically to rule out that issue of quote missed cancer screenings. Fifteen to forty four isn't an age group. People are not getting routine screening mammograms. They're not getting routine screening colonoscopies. They're not even getting routine screening skin cancer exams in those age groups. Okay, uh, that's just so. I don't believe you can make a plausible argument that missing a screening exam uh, was the, you know, during COVID, during the shutdown was why we're seeing this increase. Furthermore, um, no one, while I can give you several very plausible uh, reasons why the vaccines could account for these increases in cancers, I have yet to hear a single argument for how COVID itself, the virus itself could. And that's why it's interesting to see this trend with cancer. When we were talking just about things like blood clots, um, and people could make the argument that COVID, that the spike proteins in COVID did cause clotting, and they do. So you could have had an increase in strokes or an increase in heart attacks, uh, blood clots to the lung, for example, from COVID. But there's, I cannot think of a single um, mechanism by which COVID, the virus, would be causing an increase in cancers. So I personally am hard pressed to come up with any other explanation other than the vaccines. And as I said, I can give you multiple possible mechanisms by which the vaccines would cause this. But as you said, you're not even going there. You're saying, here's the data. This is happening. It is more than a worrisome trend because I believe that we are seeing just the tip of the iceberg. Do you see, you know, you're showing us two years worth of data. What's going on? Are you seeing any evidence that this trend is, you know, starting to, to level out? Is it plateauing? Is it continuing on the rise? Uh, we don't have the 2023 data that we've yet, but uh, the, the good news is I do think uh, disabilities have leveled out. And so an excess deaths have leveled out. And they're lower. The peak was in 21. Overall, U.S. last year was about 3%. The young still continue to die excessively, but overall, excess deaths have come down. Uh, the, 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 what we need to watch is real-time data like disabilities. And if I see another spike like I did last June, we, we can expect another wave coming because morbidity leads mortality. So right now, it seems like we're in a lull. Uh, uh, but the cancer trends are disturbing and cancer spending, if it's a leading indicator, is up 14% uh, since uh, 2020. Uh, and and, it, and, and it, the long-term growth rate was 1.7%, now it's 6.9%. So 
cancer has become a growth industry, unfortunately. We see Pfizer uh, gobbling up uh, a cancer company going on the Super Bowl, Super Bowl ads talking about their pivot to cancer. Right. And uh, the premium they paid for this company is outrageous. Other companies are now scrambling to buy cancer companies. So cancer is a growth industry. So I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves and be gloom and doomers, but I'd, I'd like to say it's leveling, leveling off, but we don't know yet. And I want to talk about the next study, which is even more interesting and, and, and has, some, uh, has some puzzling results, but is also more clear. It, and, and I want to talk about some absolute numbers as well. And before we do that, I want to, I just want to pick up on what you and I talked offline about this, this idea of, you know, cancer as an industry. Um, it's huge. And I remarked the same thing. Isn't it funny that, you know, Pfizer and Moderna are both hawking their new mRNA technology as a way to uh, treat cancer moving forward? Uh, a, a Nothing like, you know, creating a disease process and then coming up with the cure. Um, and so I, I think what you're reporting right now with regard to increase in cancer spending on, uh, on treatment technologies uh, it is, it's a, it's a sort of dark to think about, but I think it is an indicator of what's to come. I can tell you clinically what I see and what I, when I talk with other clinicians, what we are seeing um, to put some color on it is really worrisome cancers in groups of people in whom they are normally not seen. And what I mean by that is aggressive lung cancers in people in their 30s and 40s, non-smokers, aggressive colon cancers in people in their early 40s, resurgence of cancers that had been deemed to be in remission, uh, sometimes for 10 or more years, uh, and very, very aggressive tumors that are resistant to the normal chemotherapy regimens where people are going from, uh, you know, diagnosis of a, of a tumor, whether it's in the colon or the lung or the breast, that's the size, you know, of a, of a pea that all of a sudden is the size of a walnut overnight i mean these 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 tumors seem to be on steroids they've been de you know called turbo cancers but we are seeing a lot of it and what you are showing is just the gross numbers on it um but i could say when you compare your data to what we're seeing clinically i think they coincide and unfortunately but the iceberg on that piece um, so let's get into the next the, the next piece you want to talk about and then if we we'll take a break and come back and, and finish it yeah sure so we dropped a, a second report uh on research gate carlos allegra yuri nunes are the authors and uh david weissman i think uh, got an acknowledgement he was busy and didn't uh co-author this paper but um we found we we studied all age groups with a specific analysis of 75 uh, to 64. And uh, we found something interesting. Chart number th uh, three, Caleb, is uh, showing that it's a little more clean uh, in this chart. Uh, there was no signal in 2020 and a clear deviation from tw trend in 21 and 22. The numbers are the following. So underlying cause is, uh, I'm reading numbers here, uh, was basically minus 0.1% in 2020 for this age group. Uh, Z-score basically zero. 4.8% uh, increase in 21, a 10Z score, and 11.5% increase in 2022, a 24Z score. So clear signal and more demarcation in this age group in 2021. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously for this age group, you have to investigate what happened after uh, 2020 uh, specifically and began in 2021. Um, the absolute numbers, we, we, we looked at, um, I don't have charts for this, but we looked at um, to, to underlying cause and multiple cause. In multiple cause, there was a signal in uh, in 2020, which made sense because COVID took out a lot of cancer patients that were already, you know, uh, with right. comorbidities. So that signal, we saw a 3.4% increase in multiple cause in this age group, which is a 12 standard deviation. So it was a signal. And what should have happened, mm -hmm. because we pulled forward, there should have been in this age group, because they're all the pull forward effect, um, of these cancer patients, and we should have seen multiple cause cancer the next year go down. Negative excess mm -hmm. multiple cause cancer. We saw it actually accelerate to 9.2% in 21, a 34, I don't even want to get into the Z score, it's off the charts, and then a 16.4% increase in uh, 2022. So there should have been, in multiple cause, there should have been a pull forward effect, and meaning the bucket next year should have been filled up less and it would have been harder to fill the bucket. But not only did, did we fill the bucket, 
we filled it more. So this is a problem. So this, this, you know, and you know what I'm talking about, Dr. Kelly. That this is there should have been a full sure. board effect, and there wasn't. So underlying cause was a clear signal. Multiple cause. We should have seen negative excess deaths, but we didn't. We saw add-ons and add-ons. And uh, the absolute numbers are, are, are kind of stunning. For underlying cause in 2022, the excess cancer deaths were about 18,000. For multiple cause excess cancer deaths uh, with another con contributing factor were 29,000. So about 40,000 excess underlying and multiple cause deaths in 2022. That's a lot of people in this age group. The other thing is... It's just occurring to me, uh, and, and I don't know if you have an answer to this at all, but um, you know, one of the things I said very early in the pandemic, and I stand by it today, is that the virus is real. The statistics are not. Given the propensity they had to uh, over-classify things as COVID deaths, I wonder how many deaths were classified as COVID deaths that actually ultimately were deaths from cancer or one of these other things. You know, hospitals had a gross financial incentive to classify something as a COVID death. So I suspect if if the, the numbers you're seeing, I think are probably an underestimation of the actual deaths from cancer or some of these other causes, because I suspect that there were many things that were written down as uh, or codified as a COVID death that actually what you know were deaths from from a a different cause likely related to the vaccines. Um, I don't know if you have any insight on that, but that's just my, that's just my gut feeling. Uh, that, that, that's a definite possibility. We're working with the codes they gave us and that's why we, we looked at both underlying cause and multiple cause, knowing mm -hmm. that uh, in 2020 we'd see cancers, we should see cancers up in 2020 because comorbidities took some people out. Um, so absolutely. One other thing I want to point out, which is I've got to point it out because we, you know, we report the data. There were negative. So across all age groups, except one, there was a, uh, uh, a rise in cancers. Anything under age 15 in this study is the sample size is smaller. The signals aren't as clear. We, we've got a strong signal in 22, but it should be ignored. But be between 15 and 54, we saw um, uh, increasing cancers into 21 and 22. And specifically, the hardest hit group was 15 to 24. But, but in, in ages 55 through 64, there was negative excess cancer deaths in 21 and 22. That needs to be investigated. That's interesting to us. And we, uh, we mm -hmm. have to acknowledge that, mm -hmm. that, that is, that's an age group that doesn't seem to be affected. So uh, we have a theory. We're not going to talk about the theory until we do more work. But uh, it should, it, it, it'll be interesting if we can prove what we think. Well, I, I'll tell you, I, we, we we're going to cut to an ad break, but I was when looking at your your two um, charts that you're showing with this increase from, you know, 21, 22, 23, you know, it, God forbid if there's a, if the next dot on your chart continues to go up, we are in a world of hurt. Uh, there's going to be a tsunami, not only of illness and suffering. Uh, but also cost associated with this increased rise in in cancers. Um, I, I'm really hopeful that it's going to start to plateau, uh, but I, I've got my doubts. So uh, let's cut to an ad uh, break and then we'll well. come back with. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thought. I do. I do. I do as well. I, I want to. I, I'm, I'm not cheering on uh, accelerating trends. We do seem to be after the 2023 in a lull. Let's see what 2024 brings. And uh, watch the disability data. That's early, early indicator. Yep. Okay. We'll come back after the break and get into the dis disability info. You could spend thousands of dollars and dozens of hours trying to look a few years younger, or you can skip all that and the hassle and go with what works, GenuCell Skin Care. GenuCell is the secret to better skin. Their products are made in the USA using a proprietary technology that combines a naturally effective base with non-GMO ingredients. In fact, you might have witnessed the astonishing effects of GenuCell during a recent unplanned moment of our show. When just a little GenuCell XV restored my skin within minutes right before your eyes. That is how fast these products work. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. Retinols, vitamin C cream, under eye cream, night creams. 
Scrubs. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at GenuCell.com. Susan and I love GenuCell so much, we've created our own bundle so you can try our favorite anti-wrinkle creams, correcting serums, under eye treatments, say goodbye to those fine lines, forehead wrinkles, skin redness, even those dark under eye bags. Women and men of all skin types, GenuCell has got you covered. Order right now at GenuCell.com slash Drew to save 50%, actually over 50%, and you'll get a free luxury spa box plus free shipping. That is genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. We all know the value of a good night's sleep. We feel better, look better, have more energy to spare. But you could be missing out on all of those benefits if you're sleeping on sheets that are too hot or too cold or just plain uncomfortable. I have the solution. Cozy Earth Bedding. Cozy Earth is the softest and most comfortable sheets, blankets, loungewear, and more. They use premium viscose from highly sustainable bamboo, and we sleep in them regularly. I wear their t-shirts. Susan wears their pajamas. Cozy Earth Bedding comes with a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out. If you're not in love, just return them within 100 days for a full refund. Susan and I love them. In fact, we have Cozy Earth sheets on our bed right now, and they made a huge difference in our sleep. If you've never tried Cozy Earth, we have some awesome news. You can save up to 35% off Cozy Earth right now. But hurry, this offer will not last. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code DREW at checkout for up to 35% off on your first order. That is CozyEarth.com, promo code DREW, C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H, CozyEarth.com, code D-R-E-W. You asked for it, and the wellness company has delivered. The medical emergency kit, replete with ivermectin, prescription antibiotics, and more, continues to fly off the shelves. We keep one here at home. And there are three new kits you need to know about, and more are coming. The Contagion emergency kit was inspired by the high demand for the medical kits. In that Contagion kit, you'll find ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, budesonide, and a nebulizer. And a must for your next trip is the travel emergency kit, something I made sure exactly what I give my patients is in this kit and some more. The kit includes remedies for jet lag, variety of infections, even GI ailments. Imagine your flight getting grounded anywhere, say even in the U.S., and you start getting sick. You do not want to be at the mercy of the U.S. healthcare system or any healthcare system. At home, we keep the ultimate first aid kit on hand. It has over 20 essential supplies and medications for situations when time is of the essence. Order one for your car and your go bag. Because these kits contain prescriptions, your purchase includes a telemedicine consultation as well as an instruction manual. Go to doctor.com slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all your orders. I'm very excited about these kits. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. Welcome back. Uh, again, Dr. Kelly Victory filling in for Dr. Drew, who's traveling today. Uh, I'm joined today by Ed Dowd, um, who's presenting some great information, as he always does, with regard to trends in uh, diseases, uh, death rates, uh, disability since the pandemic began, and more specifically since the rollout of the vaccines. And while Ed uh, does not really pontificate about what's causing all of it's the vaccines. Um, you heard it here. It's the vaccines. <laughs> um, we all know it. Uh, this is not um, long COVID. This is not the result of uh, COVID, the virus. It's the result of this wildly failed, dangerous mRNA shot that was launched, foisted on the public. It wasn't even launched. It was foisted upon an unwitting public uh, who was mandated, shamed, coerced, or worse into taking these shots, many of them against their better judgment and their and their will. So uh, I appreciate you being here, Ed. Let's pick up where we uh, where we stopped um, with regard to you were showing some data. I think we're going to get into the disability data next that you're um, that you're presenting. Yeah, so this this is a follow-on report from our UK PIP disability data we put out. We we drilled down into neurological diseases and and deaths. This is this is disabilities, not deaths. And in this chart, we're just showing uh, these are new claims above uh, you know trend. And you can see that they really really didn't really change in 2020. Then took off 
they were up uh, 15, up 15.6 percent in 21, and then up 95 percent. And that's absolute numbers. And if you go to the next chart, it'll show the percentage changes. You can see the absolute number is about 15,000 uh, in 2022 above trend. Uh, uh, trend. So that, that's the increase above trend. These are new claims, neurological claims, all neurological. So there's the, we, we look at the system and then there's specific causes. This is the whole neurological system. Uh, these are new claims. That's an amazing number. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's clear to us. And when we analyzed it, went down into the monthly data, it really started taking off in June of 2021, coincidentally with a lag to a new novel therapeutic that was issued, that, that came out. So, you know, there was a temporal, there's a temporal relationship really started taking off when you look at the monthly data in June of 2021. So, and these numbers are not small. Again, the, the, for this age group, they're 15,000. In the tweet I put out, I, I took from the all age group, a different report, 30,000. So I've corrected it below, but 15,000 people in this age group in the UK uh, are claiming new neurological disabilities. And this is, this is a great data. This is a great, uh, this is a, a treasure trove of data for us because it's a, it's a public disability system that gets down into causes. In the US, we don't have that. So we just look at all disabilities in total without drill down. Um, the that's, down. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. That, hang on for a second. That's what I was going to ask, Ed. So this is from the UK. And it's because of that you're able to parse out the data or they parse out the data, the disability yeah. data differently than we do here in the United States, where it's all glommed together in one big bucket versus by disease process. Correct. Yep. Correct. And, and what's interesting is um, uh, we, we also looked at excess deaths in the neurological space. Uh, the, the problem, again, is the same problem, the reporting problem we have in 2022 in that there's a 30% gap. We're still waiting for the results to come in. So we, we, we use adjusted numbers, but what do we know about 2023? Total all-cause mortality for this age group, 15 to 44, it was up over 2021 to a new high. So we think we think these numbers, when they come in, will be very close to what we what we adjust. And the, the numbers are, as, that's why you have to take them with a grain of salt. The numbers are as follows. Um, the increase was uh, 18% in 2021 and 32% in 2022 with a Z score of six in uh, 21 and 10 in 22. So there's signals uh, of uh, excess neurological deaths, again, taken with a grain of salt because we had to use adjustments. But get, again, given what we saw in all cause mortality in 2023 in this age group went to a new high, we suspect when, when all the numbers come in and the historical figures, we'll, we're probably dead spot on with, the, with our, uh, our, our measurement. And although this is this is specific to neurologic uh, um, disabilities in the UK, you had reported, as I recall, Ed, significant increases in the disability claims uh, in the United States, all all in for all disabilities earlier on in the uh, vaccine rollout. Isn't that correct? You had it yeah, seems to me that you reported. The, the, yeah, the, the disabilities in the U.S. took off in February of twenty one. Uh, and the rate of change recorded that year was four standard deviations, meaning it was bumping along, nothing going on. Then it took mm -hmm. off. When we measured the rate of change, it was four standard deviations from its history, which means it's, it's just that's just mathematical speak for trend change signal. And it took off, and, and, and to the naked eye, anybody can look at this. This isn't rocket science. You can see civilian labor force disabilities going like this with some noise. And then around 2021, it just went like this, straight up. And then it paused for a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, hit a high in September of 22, paused into June of 23, then took off again. So what we're watching, is, and this is monthly data, it's survey data. So it's, it gives you a kind of a, you know, not granular, but it's, it's a good estimate. So you can, you can figure out the trend. And if we see another spike, that means deaths are coming in the future because, you know, morbidity leads to mortality. And I'm hoping it goes down and breaks trend. But right now, it's consolidating like it did last year. Ed, have you and your team um, put any financial numbers to what this this means, likely whether it's in the U U.S. or in the U.K. In terms of you know when you start talking about this wild excess in disability claims, for example, and people dropping out of the workforce, um, the life insurance claims, all of this, have you 
gotten your arms around it, the economic impact of what this what this will mean for the United States? Yeah, we did an analysis in 22. We updated it for Senator Ron John Johnson uh, recently. I, the numbers escape me at the moment, but I remember the total number, I believe, between deaths, disabilities, and injuries, we estimated about $217 billion is the uh, cost, with $40 billion being the cost, I think, in 2020. So whatever the policy measurements were, the medicine was worse than the, uh, the, 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 the disease. So it's, you know, look, you know, we're just, we're just trying to like, uh, score the, uh, policymakers and they failed excess deaths for 1.1 million in 21, 22 and 23, as opposed to half a million in 2020 disabilities were not present in 2020. They took uh, excess disabilities. They took off in 2021 and then lost work time did occur in 2020, but it really started taking off in 21 and 22. So, uh, this is, and then again, that figure 217 billion thereabouts um, doesn't take into, effect, in, in, into account the multiplier effects, lost productivity, because that's just the raw numbers that right. we calculated from, from, from the wages and, and, and national gross, gross national income accounts. So it's an estimate, could be a factor of two to 10 times bigger than that when you factor in lost productivity and multiplier effects, but it's, it's an expensive proposition. You know, you brought up something interesting about the CDC earlier. I want to make an analogy. So the CDC implemented policies, then they measure themselves to see how they did against those policies. <laughs> so that, that seems to be a problem inherent in, in itself. Imagine I implement a portfolio strategy at BlackRock. I pick 80 growth stocks. And then over three, three years later, I tell my clients, I'm not going to tell you how I did. Sorry. That's why we have third party people measuring performance every day in my, my I'm measured every day by outside people who price my fund every day. Apparently, the CDC has no such mechanism. So they, they, they measure their own results of their own policies. So that's why we don't get any information from them. No, it's really unconscionable. I was going to talk about the, you know, the, the quote policymakers uh, and and where they have been or where they haven't been. You know, the CDC. I, hopefully, people know the CDC just uh, released a 148 page study with regard to the incidence of myocarditis following the vaccines, and they redacted every single bit of every single page, 148 pages of fully redacted study. Uh, I mean, that's unconscionable. How they get away with that is uh, beyond me. Um, have you gotten, you know, you, you certainly have been talking with people like Senator Ron Johnson. You've been front and center uh, in Washington on multiple times. You've been getting your data out there. Um, have you had any feedback from anybody uh, at the CDC or FDA who's, approached you in any way interested in in your data or interested in your analysis uh that would be no unbelievable i mean you gotta think about that let that sink in um i would say you know that, that there is a group you know they they are the organization the cdc specifically center for disease control and disease prevention that's their job Yet they are not interested in these exponential increases in different disease processes. I mean, truly, what the heck is it that they do that if they haven't been, not only have they not evaluated all the VAERS reports, they've, you know, essentially looked into none of them. They're just ready to blow them off. But you have data that is, you know, and you aren't even saying what is a result of you're saying, here's the data. You tell us what's causing this trend. And they aren't even interested in looking at it. How that's allowed to happen in this country is beyond me. But um, have you reached out specifically to them uh, over these past two and a half years? I wouldn't even know who to begin to reach out to. And it, it, yeah. you know, it's not my, it's, you know, look, uh, there's, there's senators, Ron Johnson's asked for information. He's been, you know, look, if Ron Johnson can't, can't get information, there's no information yeah. I'm going to get from them. So we're using the publicly available data that we can. Uh, and, you know, something I want to bring up that's interesting. So there's been censorship and a cover up by our regulators. This creates asymmetric information. There's a um, media censorship going on. There's a collaboration between the media, the government to suppress this information, creates an opportunity. The opportunity is this data that we now present historically for free. Now people are going to be faced with questions, wondering why things are going on. 
this is going to turn into a business. We didn't even think it was going to be a business, but we've been approached by someone who wants us to make a business proposal. People that think this kind of information is valuable to decision makers who have no idea what's going on. We're three years ahead of all the academics. So this is we didn't think it would be a business, but it might be a business. Unbelievable. Well, before the, we got a few the, minutes the, left. The, the business, uh, this should not be a business. This should not be a business. Right. It, it shouldn't be, but it is. And, and, you know, uh, and God bless you for actually being the person, you know, or your group being willing to continue. You've been indefatigable during this process. Uh, it hasn't been fun. Like me, you, you certainly have suffered the slings and arrows. Everybody's always taken pot shots. Uh, you know, when you've done almost everything you've done has been for free, not as a business. Uh, you have really been working to expose this information and make it available to, uh, to to the government and to the population um, at a you know, significant personal toll, I might add. Uh, so yeah, I no, appreciate we, all the, we, the work you've done. We haven't, raised, we haven't raised any money yet, but literally an individual yeah. came to us and said, write a proposal because so keep doing what you're doing on the publicly facing data, but people want to know what to do going forward. People will pay for that. That's called projections. Projections, we've had them. We don't put them out there because... You know, we don't want to scare people and we don't want to, you know, have, you know, people just, you know, say you were wrong. So we'll, we'll sell it gladly, but, you know, no, no point right. in uh, putting it out there. No, I understand. In the few minutes we have left, I want to, I want to touch on this preprint study um, that's looking at sort of the sequelae or the side effects, what people have been calling long COVID. Um, researchers have been looking at how long the spike proteins last uh, in the bloodstream, last in different tissues. Now we know that they stick around, That the, and I'm talking specifically the spike proteins from the vaccines last in excess of 280 days. Uh, and that's as long as they've really been studied. So we're coming up that they last as long as a year. We were told people might recall that, you know, the mRNA is going to be eliminated from your body very quickly. The CDC's website still says it gets out of your body within a matter of days. Uh, we know that's a lie. They knew that was a lie at the time that they posted that. They knew that it made its way into every single major organ system within a matter of hours. 11% uh, of it alarmingly concentrating in the ovaries and testes. And we certainly are seeing uh, some significant fertility issues. That's another uh, set of data I'm hoping you guys will ultimately crunch. Uh, do you have, you had a chance to look at this, uh, this issue about long COVID versus vaccine injury? No, we haven't, I haven't looked at that paper yet. Um, you know, look, this, this is going to be interesting. This will be the debate. And we're, we're going to follow the data, and we suspect, we're not doctors, but there was, there's a spike protein that was in the original virus in 2020, and there's a spike protein in the vaccine. There could be a chance that some of the things we're seeing very, on a very small scale occurred in 2020, but are amplified by the thing that produces it ad infinitum. So we don't know yet. We're going to have to look into it. Uh, but what I what I can say definitively is when they say everything we're seeing is long COVID, that's nonsense. Yeah, well, and there's no question. I mean, from a medical perspective, there are many viruses that can cause a prolonged viral uh, syndrome, what we used to call back in the day you know, viral syndrome, post-viral syndrome, Epstein-Barr virus, for example, is well known for it. Even influenza can cause some months of fatigue and respiratory issues in certain people. It's uncommon, but it happens and lots of viruses can do it. One of the interesting things is that it's very easy to tell on tissue staining. You can differentiate between the spikes proteins that are caused by the virus versus spikes that are caused by the vag that are the produced as a result of the mRNA. They stain differently. They have a different nucleocapsid. Uh, is done. You can differentiate. Uh, and Dr. Peter McCullough and other people have made it very clear that on autopsies, uh, there's no question that the myocarditis, for example, has been caused by the vaccines. The spike proteins that they're finding in the tissue are spike proteins that happen from the vaccine, not from the virus itself. 
So I agree with you. I think all of these, quote, long COVID cases are likely uh, long vaccine cases instead. Um, what's next on your, t- just give us a glimpse, uh, Ed. Um, I know we'll have you back soon because you always have great new data sets, but what's the next data that you're looking at or capturing and, and crunching? Uh, well, we just dropped a bunch of information, probably... Uh, we're looking now at um, the overreporting on COVID, see if we can uh, glean what was going on there and come at it, uh, see if we can make any statements about the overreporting. And uh, if we can find something that uh, shows a definitive uh, answer, we'll publish it. Okay. Great. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to let you go. You know, get, if you haven't read Ed's book, Cause Unknown, uh, it's really worth looking at. So when I first started to get an idea of what uh, the data sets showed, and uh, you take a very interesting look at it, again, not from a specifically medical perspective, but again, just looking at uh, the raw data and following the trends. And I think it's a great way for people to look at it in a, um, in a more, more objective way if you don't want to buy into the quote uh, that it's the vaccine, just look at the raw data and see where, you know, where it leads you. Um, And I hope you'll come back soon. Again, sorry for the technology glitches at the beginning. You're always so accommodating. Um, We appreciate it and, uh, and really look forward to having you back with for the next data reveal. Thank you. I don't, I I don't want to interrupt you. you I also want to let people know that it looks like there's an, an updated edition of cause unknown that just recently came out. That's also available. That includes. It looks like it includes data from 2023. Is that correct, Ed? Uh, it's it not data so much as uh, uh, more news articles. It's just people mysteriously dying without any commentary as to how they would just print the articles. Good. Good. Awesome. All right. Thanks a bunch, Ed. Uh, appreciate it. And I'll, folks, I will give you the quick rundown on the upcoming shows. I don't know if you've got them printed up there. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy coming uh, on the 9th. And then I'll be back next Wednesday, the 10th, again, to cover for Drew in his absence. I've got Ivor Cummins, uh, Fat Emperor. It's always a great conversation. Uh, look at me. You've got you know, Jack Posby, you've, Matthias Desmond, okay, on, on the 16th. Uh, that should be a great conversation. Uh, I think we're still in a mass formation psychosis, so it, it isn't over yet, folks. And then uh, everybody's favorite salty cracker. So uh, thanks very much for tolerating the uh, the brief delay. COVID, uh, Caleb, you are the best at uh, sorting it out. Oh, thank so you. Thank, it you was, do- thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing that. Quite hectic over here as literally we go live everything crashes. So I <laughs> rebooted three times, then it worked. So at least we got on. Thank you guys for uh, sticking with us, especially you, Kelly. You, you like a rock star. You just made it happen. No, no worries. Thanks for having me. And I will look forward to seeing everybody uh, next Wednesday when I'm back with Ivor Cummins. Thanks a bunch. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. The parallel economy has empowered us to care for our health, well-being, as well as longevity. Likewise, for us pet parents who now have a place to go when it comes to keeping the family dogs, cats, even horses in the best shape possible. As a dog dad, I'm thrilled to be working with Pet Club 24-7, a company founded by two guys who lost dogs to serious conditions, including cancer. Pet Club 24-7 has an incredible array of products, including a line of supplements for humans, such as the Inforce Plus Corollius Versicolor and Inforce Corollius Versicolor with Reishi. My friend and colleague, Christina Ferrari, a cancer survivor herself, swears by it. When I was diagnosed, 
the doctor in the emergency room told me, you have two years to live. Oh boy. Along with the stem cell, I took these. I have been in remission for eight years now. For dogs, mush puppy treats are a fan favorite. Rex went, oh boy. <laughs> he came right. Oh, there he is. They are also made with the Coriolis versicolor mushroom, which supports their immune system, according to hundreds of clinical studies. Here's Kristen Ludlow, National Vice President. That strain does matter. We do have the most potent strain, and we also extract it in a proprietary way. And that's why we've been having such wonderful experiences with these products. Mush puppies are made here in the U.S. There are no fillers. It's not addicting. Your dog can't accidentally overdose. Go to drdrew.com slash pet club 24-7 for discount off the list price that is drdrew.com p-e-t-c-l-u-b 247 pet club 247